Oh, I feel like a rock star when they give me a microphone. This is cool. <laughs> um, th this is a version of a talk which I did earlier this year. And that was live streamed as well, no pressure. Um, I did this at, uh, at Roots Tech in Salt Lake City and it was, it was live streamed and it was recorded. So if you really want, if you're a glutton for punishment, you want to hear a sort of longer version with some of the audience questions afterwards, it's still on the Roots Tech website uh, until Roots Tech next year when it will be mercifully taken down and it will just be on <laughs> YouTube to haunt me for the rest of my life. Um, so what I'm talking about is stuff that will be very familiar to a lot of you. Um, but it's really, it, it's the indexes and the background to them, um, rather than the content of the records themselves. So that, that, that can be pretty interesting too. Now, I don't know if any of you may have read this book, came out, or a murmur of yes. Anybody read it twice? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, don't, not counting you, Elsa. Um, yes, I've read it twice. I think I may have even read it three times and made margins and marginal notes. Um, there was a lot wrong with it. Uh, you know, he could have done with an editor and he could have put, you know, a lot of the, the, the evidence that he's got as case studies in an appendix and, and sort of kept the meat of the book to a shorter length. But, you know, that, that's nitpicking. I am, um, that's greatly outweighed by really my gratitude to him for, uh, for Mike Foster for writing this book in the first place because he, like many of us, was aware that the indexes were, were not as good as they should be. Uh, but what he didn't have was the, you know, the, the cast iron evidence. And other than, you know, bits of anecdotal stuff about things that he couldn't find, the sort of things that we all come across in the course of our own researches, that you get a feeling about something, but you, can, you couldn't prove it. You couldn't write, you know, a peer reviewed article on it. So he set about, um, trying to find some evidence. And he did have unprecedented access behind the scenes at the General Register Office in Southport, uh, which you know, he would not get now. Um, but he was able to compare the marriage records and it was the marriages he was looking at rather than births and deaths. And that's quite significant. Um, and he, you know, he came up with some interesting conclusions, but he also raised an awful lot of questions. And he made some quite good guesses and speculations as to what the answers might be. Most of them were wrong, but that wasn't his fault because where he was looking is not where you would find the answers because he was looking at the records that are held at Southport from which um, they issue certificates. But the General Register Office, it's just another government department. And what do government departments do with the records that they're no longer using? They deposit them in the National Archives. So around about 20 years ago, near enough, this sort of inspired me to start looking to see if I could find some of the answers to the questions about how physically, step by step, how the indexes were compiled. And I've been doing this on and off for all that time. And an awful lot of the work I did, incidentally, was before I came to work here as a member of staff. So this is not taxpayer subsidized, this is me. <laughs> Um, and as a result, it, it took you know, more, you know, a decade and more, um, but then um, I got my name on the cover of the book as well um, with my, my co-author, Dave Annell. You know, we, it's always alphabetical order and I've written two books uh, as a joint author and both times it's been people whose surnames come before mine in the alphabet. <laughs> anyway, um, Dave is his good friend and a former colleague. In fact, when he was introducing me once doing a similar talk to this, um, he said, and, uh, and what Audrey doesn't know about early civil registration isn't worth knowing. Then he paused and said, and quite a lot of what she does know isn't worth knowing. <laughs> it's too good a line not to repeat it. His, bro his brother's a comedy writer, they're all about it. Um, so part of the research that I did actually went into that book. And it is it's the first time, other than I think I may have done a magazine article, but it's the first time that a lot of it actually appeared in print anywhere because I really went and looked at the documents, uh, you know, and I've still got my notes that I took, you know, in the early noughties and there, there, thereabouts. Now, this, th this is a graphic that I had a lot of fun putting this together, um, just explaining the hierarchy, which I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with, but I'll, I'll just explain it briefly anyway. There you've got Somerset House at the top. And the superintendent registrar really is, it, everything revolves around the superintendent registrar. 
Now, I'm sure you know that the, the, the framework for registration, when it was set up in 1837, was based on the structure of poor law unions. So poor law unions, on the whole, became registration districts. There were a few exceptions right at the beginning, um, but for the most part, poor law unions and registration districts were the same, to the extent that even the General Register Office itself often used the term union to mean registration district. And you will find that in some, um, you know, quite a lot of their, their printed output and their reports. You need to be a little bit careful with that because, as you know, boundaries change. And the first amalgamations of registration districts actually happened in the second quarter of uh, or the, what would have been the fourth quarter if they'd started in January, but the December quarter of 1837, because there were some unions that were very tiny and you couldn't find anybody who actually wanted to be superintendent registrar. Superintendent registrar's job was offered to the um, clerk to the poor law guardians for the union and the great majority of them accepted. A few didn't, either because they just didn't want the extra hassle or because they were close to retirement and they didn't want to take on another job. But the great majority, for, certainly for the first two or three decades, were, super, were superintendent registrar and clerk to the guardians and they were usually lawyers as well. Not necessarily, but most of them were solicitors. Superintendent registrar on the whole doesn't do any actual registering. They do a lot of countersigning and administration, uh, but the actual registration is done by registrars of births and deaths. So each union or most unions would be divided up into sub districts and the um, registrar of births and deaths would be responsible for registering those events in his own sub district. And it always was a he up until the 1870s. <coughs> Um, I've looked at the legislation and it never occurred to anybody to restrict the job to, to men. It never said that women couldn't do it. In practice, the first female registrars uh, were in the early 1870s, but there was no great fanfare. It was no news event. Um, and the, for the first two or three decades, almost all the women registrars that I've come across were either the, the, the widow or the daughter of the previous registrar. Um, you know, just nice little footnote there, but I, I, I thought it was nice that it didn't occur to anybody to forbid women from doing it, which is a nice change for the 1830s. <laughs> so the registrars of births and deaths, they record their, you know, all, all the events that came to their attention. A registrar of marriage, at least one would be appointed for each registration district. Now the registrar of marriages might or might not also be a registrar of births and deaths. But the registrar of marriages was responsible for conducting marriage ceremonies anywhere within that registration district. This included in the register office, but in practice there were almost no register office weddings. The proportion was just so tiny it's barely visible. Most of what the registrars of marriage did was they went to non-conformist places of worship that were registered for the performance of marriages uh, so that they could officiate and do the legal bit. And until 1899, um, that was the only way you could get married in a Baptist chapel or a Catholic church was if you had a registrar of marriages present and the, you know, the, it would go in his or possibly her register book. So they are registrar marriages but they are mostly not register office marriages. That's the registrar of marriages, and you see that they, um, they report to the superintendent registrar. And there is a sort of a chain of command. It was a bit of an odd setup because the registrars were recruited and appointed by the poor law union. But if, if they did something uh, that, that required their dismissal, it, it was only the Registrar General's authority could actually sack them, uh, which led to some interesting correspondence. Uh, they had a very peculiar occupation uh, sort of set up, but the vast majority of marriages, of course, were performed by Church of England clergy, who, by virtue of being Church of England clergy, were automatically registrars of marriages under the new system, in exactly the same way that they'd been performing marriage ceremonies um, you know, for centuries. 
They were not part of the chain of command exactly, hence the dotted line. They had duties and responsibilities under the Registration Act, principally to do with marriages, uh, and they had to forward their, uh, their quarterly returns every three months to the, to the superintendent registrar who would then forward them to Somerset House, which is where the, the interesting stuff happened and they compiled the indexes. This did not go smoothly all the time. Sometimes it was just clergy who were, you know, they may have been excellent in many ways, but paperwork wasn't what they were best at. And they just weren't terribly efficient at getting stuff done and copying stuff out. A few of them were deliberately obstructive because the Church of England as a body was not keen on civil registration. It knew the thin end of a wedge when it saw one coming. Some had absolutely principled objections, which are fair enough, and some of them were just, there goes my monopoly of, of marriages, there goes my income. Um, and in particular, if you were looking for the marriage in the GRO of uh, anyone in, in the uh, around about Wolverhampton in the first sort of very early years of civil registration, if you can't find it, then you can probably lay the blame at the door of the Reverend Boyle, who was extremely uncooperative about handing in registers uh, there's a lot about him in the Registrar General's correspondence. Then the other dotted line goes to authorised persons. Now, I said that until 1899, a registrar had to be present in a church, in, in a non uh, Church of England church. From, from an act in 1898, uh, people could apply to be an authorised person, which meant that uh, you, usually these would be people like Baptist ministers. Uh, or Methodist clergy and so on, who could apply to be an authorised person to perform marriages with all the authority of a registrar in their own place of worship, provided it was registered. Uh, and then that, that's when um, you, you start getting actual uh, proper registers being kept by uh, the authorised persons of particular places of worship. Again, this didn't always work out particularly smoothly because a Church of England clergyman was ex officio a registrar. When you took on the job, when you got a parish, you were authorised. If you were you know, a Baptist or a Methodist minister or a Catholic priest, when you took on the incumbency of whatever chapel or church it was, you were not automatically the new registrar of marriages. You had to apply in person to be registered. And some of them didn't realise that. So there were, for a few years, there were a number of retrospective um, you know, authorizations you know, by the, the, the Registrar General um, who realized, you know, because they repeatedly found that people had in good faith have been performing marriages that they weren't entitled to do, but it's okay, you know, they, they were, you know, they were subsequently legalized. So um, I, I just say J.B. Priestley, when we are married, that is absolutely that, you know, that, that story. So that was so that that is basically the structure. Now, sending these quarterly returns into the the GRO did not always go smoothly either, and th this is um, one of the many things I've seen. This comes from you see the reference at the bottom because I'm trained to put my references on things properly. Um, treasury letter books. There's a whole series of them, but from 1836 right up to the you know the early 1900s and these are letters between the general register office and the treasury and some of the stuff in there is pure gold and this is a heartfelt thing so some grumpy clerk you know the clerk sent by the superintendent registrar of leeds willfully destroyed the packet of quarterly returns instead of posting them to the gro 2086 entries in all um, the registrar general instructed the superintendent to obtain duplicate copies at a cost of fifteen pounds, one shilling and fourpence. Um, I had a look using free BMD, and there do seem to be about the right number of birth and death entries. Uh, so either the, the, you know, the poor Mister uh, uh, Lampham, you know, he, he, he did get the job done. What the motives of this clerk were, I don't, I don't know, because the postage was paid. It wasn't um, the, oh, if I go to the, you know, I'll pocket the postage money and then chuck the stuff away instead of posting it. Um, 
so it, it was just, you know, maybe they'd just been fired or they were lazy. I don't know. It's all very Billy Liar. But anyway, that was the, that's an example of the sort of thing that you were up against. You've got to physically get this stuff from A to B and then the fun begins. Um, and this is um, another quote from a, a, a later book. This is once the Authorised Persons Act had come in, um, the, the, the marriages, some licence April last by about 1,000. So the, there was a big rush there. Uh, are now being received, and they naturally display an infinite variety of blunders and contraventions um, of a more or less serious character, which, which I think is a really nice way of saying if you thought the CV clergy were bad, you should see what this shall look like. <laughs> so th this is why the marriage records are, quite, are particularly vulnerable, uh, more so than the births and deaths, because they were done entirely by people who were employed to do registration, that was their job. Whereas the clergy and the authorised persons doing the you know, marriage registration was part of a much bigger function. So you do get more weird things and mistakes and omissions going on in the marriages, but they happen in the other records too. This is what happened to the, the quarterly returns, the loose sheets, when they arrived at Somerset House. First of all, they would be examined. Now, they these people weren't mind readers, but you could spot obvious mistakes, things like a date of registration being earlier than the date of birth, or things that weren't filled in properly, or just information that was plainly, contra you know, internally contradictory, but you couldn't possibly tell if somebody had got a name wrong or an age wrong, they, you know, they, you know, that, that was, you know, that was just not possible. Uh, but any obvious faults, there was a correspondence section that would then query this, uh, and then hopefully get the correct version back. Once they got everything that they were going to get, um, and it wouldn't necessarily be everything because there comes a point when you cannot hold everything up just for one or two clergy who still haven't sent the blessed things in despite several reminders. Uh, but when you'd got what they'd got, they would be arranged and paged. And these loose sheets would be, first of all, they'd be in uh, sub-district order for births and deaths. For marriages, it would be according to the, the church or the, the, uh, with the register office ones coming at the end. And then um, within, you, you'd have all the sub-districts within a district and they would be in alphabetical order. And then the districts would be uh, bundled together in, um, in, in areas which, which are, the there was, there was no administrative function to be put together into what we now call volume numbers. But volume, you know, 3A, for example, that covered a particular area, but it was purely uh, an administrative convenience for putting a book together. There was nobody in charge of 3A. It wasn't a, an area with boundaries and officials. It was just a way of, of dividing these things up. So you've got pages um, within sub-districts or places of worship, then within a registration district, and then the registration districts, again, alphabetical order, within their, what was going to be their volume. Um, sometimes the alphabetical order is a little bit weird because when you've got things that might or might not have saint at the beginning of them, that, that's, you know, that, that causes some confusion, but that's roughly the, the, the setup. And then once you've got things in order, then you would give them page numbers, which is why the page numbers of the GRO are of no use if you're looking locally because they are purely for these quarterly returns generated and um, created by the GRO. And incidentally, that's why you will get, um, if you look, in, if you're the sort of nerd who downloads a load of things and number crunches and plays with them. Um, <laughs> why are you laughing at me? Um, you will see that there are actually more entries on odd numbered pages. Because if you think about it, blank sheets, everyone, it's, it's an odd number on the front and then even on the back, Every single odd numbered page will have something on it. But a lot of the even numbered pages might have nothing. So that, that's why you, you get this, you know, it's just, it's just a funny number thing. Um, then when you've got them all arranged, then they start transcribing. And what was transcribed was the information that was going to go into the indexes. And this was transcribed onto, um, well, what became slips but there were transcription forms. I've got an example I can show you in a minute because I found one in the records. Well, I found three actually, birth, marriage and death. And they were, they were forms which were then cut into to slips. 
and each slip had the information on it that was going to go in the index, which in the early years was exactly the same for every event. It was the last name, the first name, um, registration district, volume and page number. And it wasn't until 1866 that you started getting any uh, departure from that with when the, uh, the age of death was up. So that was the transcription. And um, what a fun job that must be. <laughs> well, those of us who were members of family history societies long enough ago may be quite familiar with that. I mean, it might have been bits of paper in a plastic Tupperware box that you took home after your society meeting and you'd sort them and bring them back for the next meeting and then some poor soul would type them out. But they, yeah, that's roughly what they did. That was Victorian technology. Um, then once you got all these slips, somebody had to sort them, which was even worse. I think that must have been the worst job sorting an infinite, endless um, number of slips into alphabetical order. And then once that was done, they would be indexed. And the indexers were the people who, um, up until 1865, hand wrote the indexes onto the, the vellum pages. And then finally, they would go to the, the indexes, would go to the search rooms, and the bound volumes of these quarterly returns would go to the vaults. Um, I, 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 I'm trying to imagine what it would have, must have looked like in about 1838, 1839, in a search room within a shelf. Um, <laughs> although they very quickly began to um, worry about running out of space. That's what a, 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 is what part of the transcription slip looks like. There, there are actually 10 on there, but that, I, I, that's just what fits onto the page. This is a very, very late one uh, before they changed the system uh, from handwriting these slips. Uh, they, they, had, they were very good with uh, adopting new technology, carbon paper. <laughs> Quarterly returns would be sent in after that with um, carbon copies. Uh, now, the, I'm sure this was great when you've got a lovely, fresh piece of carbon paper. Um, but fresh pieces of carbon paper don't usually stay that way for very long. So I think some of the ones they got in must have been a little bit blurry um, once they've been used a while. But this is quite interesting. So this is a late one, so it's evolved a bit that you've got the, um, the, the registration district and the volume is uh, printed on there already. Uh, and B is, is, is the verse, and so you've got the volume, the, the 2A on there. And then the page number stamped on there with a rubber stamp. So this is this would have speeded up the, the, the process and made it more efficient. And I, I, what I like is you've got this gutter between the entries so that if, if somebody's handwriting strays um, beyond the lines, you, you don't lose so much of it in, into you know, the, another entry. Um, so that, that was all quite well thought out. What the original ones looked like in 1837, I don't know. I suspect uh, a bit more primitive and just handwritten, but essentially that was the system that really didn't change. And even when they went on to using carbon paper, you still had slips that were then sorted uh, manually and then somebody typed them up. And that carried on actually until 1969, when you got the massive redesign of the birth and death forms and the, the, they began to use computers to prepare the indexes, although they didn't keep the files. This is a, an example, you know, I was talking about the, the clergy not always getting things right. This is a certificate that I bought. You can see I got it in, in uh, 1998. I, I was tracing the direct ancestors of a friend and I got stuck. And this was in the days, of course, no free BMD to search the marriages on. You did it the hard way. You searched, you searched, you searched, and you noted down the light and you, and you, you looked for a, you know, a matching um, spouse in the same volume and page. And I looked and I looked and I couldn't find it. I was looking for, for Joseph Rhodes to marry Sarah Ridgway. And I did all the things you should do. I rechecked, I did it again. And then in desperation, I thought, well, it's just possible it's a mistake. Maybe the indexer wrote down the wrong name. And I ordered it, no, it's John. Damn. Anyway, I put that to one side um, and, I, and I left it for a while. And then of course, um, duh, it took a while for the penny to drop. Of course, then kept the wonderful UK BMD and what was the first county to do the, you know, to, to start indexing from the registrar's records? It was Cheshire. Where is Stockport? Well, okay, great enough, but there or thereabouts. So I thought, you know what? 
why don't I have it? You never know. It's just possible that the clergyman making the copies when he sent them to the GRO might have been wrong. And I'd always advise people, if you've got a church marriage and you get it from the GRO, if you can, try to look at the church copy because there might be a difference. You know, it might not be anything dramatic, but there might be a little piece of information. Of course, you get the original signatures. Anyway, I looked on um, the, the, the Cheshire site and I, uh, lo and behold, I found the marriage of Joseph, not John, Joseph Rose to Sarah Ridgway. Because the one I found, you know, it was in exactly the right place, the right time, everything seemed to fit except the man's name. Um, now you'll notice, of course, this, it, see, it took me a while, 2004, it took me six years before we had the advantage of the I got this from Stockport Register Office. Now, the, the cynics among you, which I hope is all of you, will say, yes, that's handwritten. How do you know that that's an accurate copy of what's in the register? Well, a while after that, of course, the Cheshire Parish Registers uh, went online and find my past, and there is the, the, the copy from the church register. So I am very confident that that groom is called Joseph Rose, and the man to blame is John Howard Cressy Wright, M.A., curate who you know, and I know it's because it's his writing on the quarterly return so it was his fault um, and he was not alone so it's just a solitary tale it's bad genealogy to think oh this doesn't fit with my theory therefore it's wrong but sometimes it's worth chasing something up just in case there is a mistake and in this case there was um, I mentioned that, that that was it was kind of a tedious job the monotony of constant writing persevered in during nine or ten hours every day on task work. Task work is what we would now call piecework. The, uh, the, the, you couldn't do it with the sorters, but the transcribers and the indexers, they were paid according to the amount of work that they did, uh, which would obviously encourage them to be quick and careless, which sometimes they were, but the work was checked, not as much as it should have been, but it, it, there were checks. Um, and uh, this, I just came across this a couple of days before I was doing uh, a similar talk to this, and I couldn't resist it. This is from the uh, you know, Castle's New Penny Magazine, 1899. Uh, the tedium of this labour is often relieved by coming across a humorous juxtaposition of names. Then the face of the clerk will be covered with a smile. Um, I just think it's a wonderful graphic. It goes on to list these supposedly funny names, which may have been hilarious in 1899. We didn't know that. But I think we all have our own lists. And they're not always, you know, some of them are a bit rude, so we're not going to go there today. Um, I'm sure you have your own. This is, um, again, from, a, from another, um, from an RG20 series, which is sort of background material in the GRO. This is an analysis of errors made by uh, five index compilers over six or seven years. I think this is extremely dodgy because look, they actually add up to, to, you know, to a very round number. That's a bit suspicious. And they do, this is a manuscript thing which somebody typed into a spreadsheet and checked it just to see, but it absolutely was. Um, but it doesn't say which six or seven years and it doesn't say that it was the same for all of them. They were all fairly experienced clerks because um, in my favourite document, which this is, RG 2098, uh, that includes the names and in many cases the dates of birth and the dates of service of everybody who worked in the General Register Office from um, 1836 until about 1881. Um, so, very useful. That's why it's my favourite document. Anyway, so I, so I know who these people were. As a slightly more detailed analysis. It kind of makes the point. Some of these would be fatal errors and some of them wouldn't. I mean, a slight misspelling, probably not a disaster, but sometimes, um, you know, having a, a completely different name, one Christian name for another, I mean, abridging the name of the union or misspelling the union name, not a major problem. But it just shows you, you know, the sort of things that could happen. These people are only human. I think they did a remarkably good, good job considering, but they weren't perfect. That's what the uh, a nice, you know, an actual page looks like. You can only really see them as black and white scams. But an example of a mistake. This was meant to be um, for a, a yeah. That was meant to be from a birth index. And they obviously realised that, oops, we, um, we were using it for marriages, but they weren't going to waste all the parchment. Um, they gave timeless money. It, it, um, 
Clocks could be dot you know, they're pay dot for if they messed up this very expensive parchment. In practice, I don't think that happened very often because it was more important to get the work done. So you do get alterations. And you can probably just about see it on little faint pencil marks, uh, which were the more senior clerks who checked the work. You see these sometimes at the beginning of each of the quarto, and uh, sometimes they will make a note of the number of mistakes, and sometimes you could see corrections, which you could see if you can when you could feel a parchment volume, where you see a slightly fuzzy bit of writing where it's been the ink's been scratched out and the correcting written in. But sometimes you'll get something like that, where a block of names is in the wrong place. And that would be the sorter's fault, but the poor indexer wouldn't know until he'd already written the ones in front. So that, that's that's the sort of thing. You know, you, you you can you can almost imagine being in the room with these poor people. And then the indexes from 1866 were printed. Um, I include this one. This is a, an example where you've got um, information that arrives too late um, after the, the, the they've all been the index has been printed. And something comes in a bit late, and it could be written in. You see these reasonably frequently. The one at the bottom, um, this is a woman um, who, who was born in 1881, but her birth wasn't registered until 1933. So that's the, that's the longest gap. I've seen quite a few after decades, but that was the, that's the, the longest <coughs> one. Um, so uh, these would be written in on the GRO's paper copy. And then you went on to typed indexes from uh, 1910 onwards. Uh, and then you, you get the uh, you get the the surname of the spouse uh, from 1911, and the no, I, I always get the. I've only been doing this about 30 years, and I always get this wrong. Uh, you you get the the, the main surname of the mother, and then um, a year later you get the, the the surname of the spouse, which makes life quite a lot easier. And then the um, the later ones from 1969 onwards, they were prepared by computer, and you know. There, you, you go back, you get full names. Um, the, when they went to the printed indexes, they, you'd get two full names and then the rest of the initials. Except for 1866 itself, when you get one full name and then an initial. What sort of person notices a thing like that? <laughs> anyway, um, but then when they go on to computerized ones, you go back to getting two, two names and then. Um, uh, initials when you know, the, the, there had been less information in the earlier ones. Um, well, looking at some of the correspondence, they weren't always entirely sure why it had been done that way some time ago. Um, but you know, that, that's the, the form, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. Uh, and then the deaths, a significant thing from 1969, of course you get the age of death, which is very useful. And there, there's, a, there's a very famous death there, Jimi Hendrix died in Kensington in 1970. So, um, yeah, this is for an American audience. <laughs> Lovely old free BMD. I mean, the things I can do with this, you know, it, 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 it's good for finding stuff, yeah. But you can do so much more with it. I quite often sort of reconstruct a, um, you know, click on the page number just to see what's there. And of course, that's how I, you know, one of the things there you can see is that John Spong read and John Spong Spong yeah. <laughs> Not a um, that's going to be the same person and you know and I look to see uh, what, what you know, there shouldn't be more than 10 births and if there is there's something wrong which you know, and, and there are all sorts of reasons why that uh, again in this case one birth index price uh, and then sometimes you know, there were too many on one page and not enough on another, and that's because somebody forgot to change the page number, or the BF, free BMD transcribe couldn't read the thing which is not surprising because some of the things you're trying to read from are pretty awful. So I do an awful lot of that. Um, some of the tools on free BMD, but they're just wonderful for that. Um, and this is another thing. I, this was something I knew happened. The surname Dax, pretty rare. These are all the Daxes from 1855 to 64. And then in December 64, there's an outbreak. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happened. When some of the early indexes before 1866, um, the old manuscript index, some of them were retyped. And sometimes in the retyping, people made mistakes. And you can see what happened here. You've got Gilbert Elliot Dax, and then the typist should have put day for Ada Caroline. So all the people after Ada Caroline should have been day. 
Um, and the, the, the fact that Gilbert comes later in the alphabet than Ada is also another clue. But, you know, it could have been, if, if he'd been, I can't think of a name that starts with A and comes before A, but anyway, um, if, if he'd been called Arvark, um, you that wouldn't have been so obvious. But th th this is something, you know, I've used FreeBMD to find examples of this. Um, and then that's what the page looks like. When you go to the top of the next page, we've correctly gone back today. So everybody between Ada and Ellen, they're wrongly down the stacks. So if you're looking for somebody called Day in that quarter, they're down the stacks. So this is the sort of things that happen. Something else that's often, um, is one of the very few downsides of free BMD is that because you're not having to look at the books, you're not aware that at the end of each quarter, you've got a list of unknowns. And these are unknown deaths, they're mainly, you know, anonymous children age zero. But sometimes they're there, you know, policeman Jack age 40, or, you know, you, 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 the, the local um, sort of harmless, you know, I, mean, I, I don't like to say village idiot, but somebody, you know, the bloke that everybody knows, but nobody knows what his real name is and he drops dead and he knows about this or that age. So if you can't find a death, it's probably one of them. Um, and then that, that's, that's it really. Um, GRO, and there are their indexes. Interesting uh, new development. And they have the union written in full, which confuses some people terribly. Oh, it says that they were in such and such union. Does that mean they were in the workhouse? No. Um, but uh, yeah, so I just thought I'd finish on that, which you're obviously very familiar with. Sorry, else I've gone on a bit, but I've tried to go as fast as I could. <laughs>
Churchill has an Ill illegitimate child, Charles Morris Churchill, who's in the index is for 1858, being born and dies in 1859. The clue might be, who's this, what's this, what's going on with this Morris? Well, she does actually have an affiliation order that's reported in the newspapers, but whereby that a James Morris of St. Leonard's and then the neighbouring parish is ordered to pay one and six a week towards the support of the illeg illegitimate child. Women could apply for these affiliation orders after 1844, rather than the parish applying for them. So you do see them in the newspapers and you do often see people, men who renege on these affiliation orders, not in, in, uh, neglecting to pay them. So the newspapers might fill in this gap. Just to fill in the case study, um, she actually um, is seen in the 1861 census um, after the death of the first child, Charles, with, um, with another uh, illegitimate child, William Churchill. Um, no evidence of a hint of the father's name in this registration. They're in the 1861 census with her parents. In a, but by 1871, she had married James Davis and had two more children. He dies and she marries for a third time and she's found in the 1871 census with um, uh, her husband, uh, William Morris, who is actually, actually the brother of the first child who begat the illegitimacy. <laughs> what happens if the indexes, if the entry just can't be found in the index? Now you think as a distinguished genealogist, Lieutenant Colonel Hubert, or sometimes known as Herbert, Kendall, sometimes Kendall David, <laughs> Percy hyphen with or without Smith, <laughs> would be fairly easy to find in the, index, in the indexes. Well, he died in, in um, 1975, and we have an obituary of him in the, in the genealogist magazine, which says it was his 78th year. You go to get, go get, get the age, uh, the, the date of, de of, of birth, as recorded in the post uh, 1966 um, death indexes, and this index just uh, shows you that he was born about 1898, inferring, of course, that the, the informant didn't know when he was born. Um, he attained the Shrewsbury School Register, which we have in the Society of Genealogists, which just says he was born in 1897. Um, he's a distinguished officer in the Indian Army, in, in, in the, uh, in the, in the Indian Army, and um, that that his biography. Uh, tells us he was born on 9th of September 1897. As, as a good um, SOG member, he completed what we call a birth brief, which is a, a skeletal um, description of his family, him, his parents, his grandparents, great grandparents, etc. And he tells us in that himself that he was indeed born on 9th of September in Tong, in, in Salop, or as the Shropshire was known then. And because there are nine, there is a baptismal certificate for him. Um, a few days later, on the 1st of October, in Tong, in Shropshire. Um, but interestingly, there's something going on here because he's been added as an extra annotation, confirming all this information. So I've, I've gleaned this information from other sources, but I have been completely defeated in finding an index entry for him in the civil registration indexes. The family do register. They register his siblings perfectly sensibly just not him. So clearly I think there is a clerical error going on, but it does seem to be compounded in his life. So you think, well, okay, well, let's do as Audrey says, let's go back to the local registrar, um, through the, you know, find out that, that uh, Shropshire, uh, um, you can find information about which local registration services are put information online and find, it, and find the address. Um, Tong has been, a, is in various registration districts, over the years, so I've discovered which is the current registration district, and I write to them and explain that I've, all the evidence suggests he's born on a particular day. Is there any chance they could look and see if he's been registered in the right registration district? And I'd love to say that that solved it, but it didn't. They couldn't find it either. So I don't know what's going on there. So the census is the, 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 the integral to uh, our genealogy work in, in the 19th century. God bless the Victorian bureaucrats that introduced civil registration, along with the improvement in census records from 1841 up to um, that decennial snapshot of the census up to 1911. Um, 
and of course being readily available online, there's all sorts of information we can gain from them. Just a refresher, you know what you'd expect to get from the censuses from 1851 to 1911, name, sex, relationship to her household, um, the age at the last birthday, parish and county of birth, their occupation, and of course the extra information that starts coming in in 1911, asking, you know, because of the interest in infant mortality, how long have the couple been married, how many children are <coughs> born of that union, and how many still living, and how many dead. Um, and of course, this is the first time that soldiers who are living overseas are enumerated in the census. Prior to that, they're only enumerated if they're in barracks in England and Wales. 1841 census, not quite as informed as I'm sure you know. These, the, the, the enumerators were instructed to round the ages down to the nearest five years, so there's always an ambiguity about ages in the census. If it ends with a zero or a five, you can reckon they have um, obeyed the instructions, but you see many ages of people aged over 15 where it's clearly you know, 63, 47. Is that absolutely right? Could they, did, were they confused in, um, uh, in, in operating instructions? Was it just too complicated? Which is what I suspect it was, which is why they stopped doing it in the next, in the next census. So let's have a look and see what you can find from the censuses. Um, here, as I said, the extra information. We've got uh, William Beckham and Harriet Beckham, children, and indeed his, his parents. So three generations which you can find and, of course, put into a, a family tree to understand what's going on and take the clues from that. The two, so extra children, um, the two of which died, one not, not in, in the household at the time of the census. So you're looking for those extra clues and the, and the um, evidence of their ages and their suggested births. Well, there's another infliction of Churchill's on you. Um, Prothero Churchill is my grandfather. He's a, a, a civil registration Google whack. He's the only one. He's the only one ever registered from 1837, um, as far as I can see, up to the present day, with that combination of names, Prothero Churchill. So the, the five entries that relate to him are his birth, his three marriages, and his death. And that's, that's a real delight to know that that's right. Uh, however, there are the clerks, and there are various ways you can spell Prothero or misspell Prothero is another matter. But however, um, there's a certain ambiguity about what you can find um, from them. the relationships. We have somebody here described as a niece of um, Flory. Um, Flory is described as a niece of the head of the household. It's much more complicated than that. Um, it turns out that she is um, the first cousin once removed of William's wife and the, the second cousin of his son, Flory. Provero and Flory are the great grandchildren of James Green, born around 1794. So this ambiguity of relationships, um, I've, I always have friends of my parents who were called auntie and uncle. Um, I'm sure you just so don't trust always the relationships that say that. They don't always work out to be quite the same. And um, William Churchill is a bit ambiguous about his ages and certainly the place of birth that's recorded about him. Um, he says he's born in Broad Oak, um, but there's no indication of where Broad Oak is. Um, when, when, when he's in the 1911 census of Judea Green, Wales. Ten years earlier, he said, he gives me a clue, it's Herefordshire. Um, and it takes a bit of time to work out that he actually bought, is born in Broad Oak, which is a hamlet of St. Leonard's in, in um, Herefordshire. And it's, all, it's, it's by piecing all the censuses together that you can work these clues out. Absolutely vital because I can't tell you how many William Churchills are actually born in the same year as him. Um, and without trying to establish you know, where he is born from the census, I'm not going to spend all that money on the certificates. So we work our way through the various censuses. You can get, you can work from generation. There's William, um, born 1858, who's the son of William, born uh, 1825, who is the son of James, born 1775. And you can see, and then there is the ambiguity because in one, uh, in, James shouldn't have been 60 in 1841. He would be, should be rounded down from 70. So again, something's going, something's going wrong in what's just recorded on there. But we end up with um, James Churchill and his family. Um, but, I can't, but James in, in his household does not have William Senior born around 1825 living with him. But there is a William Church in the, um, in the census. Now, is he related? There are no churches in the parish register. Um, so is this William Church, the William Churchette, or Churchill, who's, back, who's baptized in 1825. Well, the, family, the, um, the elder brother of William is a, 
uh, was prosecuted for a very serious assault before he, uh, when he, of which he was convicted and transported to Tasmania. Um, they tried, in, as part of his defence, to uh, say that the, uh, the victim had actually had an ongoing feud with the family and been said that I was going to get that those Churchill family, one of the Churchills, I'll get you transported. And when challenged, you know, is it really the elder brother John, the elder brother John that assaulted her? She said she could swear positively to him. He's sometimes called Church, which I'm going to give as added credence to some of the extra information I could find. I would point out that although John was, was um, uh, convicted of this particular heinous sin, um, his younger brother William, who had contributed to his defence and pointed out that he had eight shillings a week, of which he could have saved five, um, something that's not come down in the church or genes, I can tell you, I can assure you. Um, he is described by the judge as the more respectable brother, so I'm dining out on that one quite a bit. And of course, um, not everyone gives the information they should in the census. Here is Limehouse in 1871. If you were to look through this, you would see several of the men in the various lodging houses in this area. Their, dis their occupation is sailor. A, dis a disproportionate number, I would suggest, to call Smith. And if you look very clearly at the, um, uh, at the occupation of the women, it is described as fallen. And the poor, and the poor enumerator at the bottom has actually said, the fallen women in these areas do not know either the names or ages of the men who have lived with them at their time, and therefore a large part of the ages in there are just called not known. So um, if you can't find your ancestors in the census, far be it for me to suggest that they're somewhere where they shouldn't be, but also more possibly they may well be in, a, um, in an institution where names and, uh, are, are abbreviated to a, 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 a initials, an abbreviate, um, just four names, so in, you know, EC, for example, where you may have to search on, on age, place of birth, etc. Um, of course, you will know as good genealogists that, that if you look at sources and try and analyse the, the people who they live with, who they're living near, who they're working for, the, what's called the cluster or fan, family association and neighbours, the extra clues that can come through this. I wish I had looked at this um, when, I was, when I was researching William Churchill, um, uh, William Churchill Jr., who uh, in 1911 uh, uh, has his uh, uh, mother-in-law living with him. When I went to, when I went to actually uh, look at the, uh, the in-laws, I found the same, I've, I'd looked at this page before, and the 1891 census, uh, sorry, the 1901 census, prior uh, to, to this, we have, um, his, his in-laws are actually living just two doors down the road. So it's again, the, the same families living close to each other. So when you're looking at, at the census, don't just look at the household, look, look perhaps who are, who's living near them. Um, so here we can say William, William in, and his, his mother-in-law, James Green, and the Greens turning up on the same page. And um, here's another example, uh, Mary, the wife of William Churchill of St. Leonard's, gives evidence against the neighbours, James and Elizabeth Vaughan, accused of aggravated assaults on their 14-year-old son, Andrew Williams. Andrew describes him as his mother. So um, I presume this is the stepson of um, James Vaughan. But you'd never guess that what was going on with these families just by looking at the relationships in the census. They are, they are neighbours, um, but you get extra, extra, extra clues here. Um, in fact, William, they are not only neighbours, but they are they are related. The, the Vaughans and the Churchills intermarry constantly over a period of 200 years. In fact, it's surprising to me that the Churchills have any chins at all. Um, uh, William Churchill's sister Martha married James Vaughan's brother Noah, so they are related as well as neighbours. Uh, you can use other sources perhaps to sort out anomalies that occur from the birth, death and marriage indexes. Now, William Churchill who, um, disappears from the electoral roll in 1924. And there is a William Churchill death in 1924 in the right registration district. The assumption I make is that that's when he died. But this is what happens when you don't buy the certificate, folks. A baptismal entry came up online relating to this death in 1924 in Evervale, not the right place, I'm expecting to be Jadiga, and um, I'm thinking, well, this isn't, this isn't right, so, if it, so 
Let me have a look at this one who dies in 1924 in more depth. Let's look at that address that I've got from the baptismal entry for the 1911 census. And it's clearly not my guy who was born in Herefordshire, it's someone born in Staffordshire. I did tell you how many Williams were born in, the, in that year. So, okay, so if my guy didn't die in 1924, let's have a, well, there's another one who dies in 1946, but entirely the wrong registration district. I neglected it because it's, it's was way, it was you know, a far away place. So by looking at the, um, if he's alive in 1946, um, I, I can look in the 1939 register, and there is William Churchill with the right date of birth. Okay, this is looking promising. Um, but why is he living with Elizabeth Jane Pugh and William Arthur Pugh? Um, and indeed, that's the same address in 1946, where he, in the will indexes. And it turns out that he's actually moved in, moved with his daughter. So he moves in 1924. He doesn't die in 1924. Just because A and B uh, come together, it doesn't always lead to C. This is one I'm still working on. Um, but all, in all censuses, Bertha Lewis says she was born around 1868-9 in Cardiff. And there is only one Bertha Lewis, the, the, the daughter of um, uh, uh, Bertha Lewis, uh, she, she, she ends up in, uh, she, sorry, let me get it right. Bertha, Bertha Lewis made, was made Williams, and Bertha Williams was born in 1868-9. She went on to marry Lewis, a, uh, Abraham Lewis, and her, that's her birth certificate showing her, her, her date of birth in this on uh, the 4th of December, 1849, and so why is, and there is a baptism in uh, December 1849. So why in the 1839 register does she give a completely different date of birth, which happens to be exactly 42 days earlier than the birth certificate? So I've set up a couple of examples of this where they seem to have fudged the date of birth quite often to fit in with the, with the, with the uh, uh, restrictions on registration. I've got several members of the family who use a birth date that's not the birth date on their birth certificate. The birth date on the certificate being within the 42 days of registration. Uh, other clues of age and dates of birth can be found perhaps in the um, school registers. Prothero and his, and his brothers and sisters are, uh, have their dates of birth in the various admission registers and logbooks of the schools they attended. And of course, the most important source for the death and marriage information used by family historians are, of course, the church registers. The records of the established church, which go back to 1858 in England and Wales, though I have to point out that above those, that of the nearly sort of 13,000 parishes in England and Wales, only about 800 parishes have registers that go back as early as 1538. So let's have a look and see the kind of information you can find. Um, so here we have a brand new uh, register um, instigated by the Reverend Trollope in um, the 1st of, 1st of January 1837 under the Roses Registration Act, where he's now asked to note down the uh, name of the child, the parent's name, occupation, and where in the parish they're living. And because he's got, clearly got this new register, this new, new, um, uh, new, new broom to sweep with in the church records, he's encouraging baptisms and he clearly speaks to Lily Day. He said, Lily, come on Lily, you need to get your two kids baptised. And here we have two children of Lily Day. Um, the first is the son of Thomas Dimmock. Uh, and uh, Thomas, Thomas the Bath, son of Dimmock Ward and, and of Lily Day. Dimmock is the local joiner. And the second child is of Lily Day and um, John Goodrich, the local publican. Um, in both cases, the, the vicar has described the, the occupation of the mother, and he describes, excuse the language of the day, he describes the day as a whore. They have two different fathers, they're baptised on the same day, they clearly cannot be twins. Do not always make the assumption when you look in databases that children born on, um, christened on the same day are twins. Clearly not in this case. Um, in the clearly, um, assiduous these tasks because later on he has the illegitimate child um, uh, Maria Thomas, sorry, Maria, the daughter of Thomas Ashton and Mary Wynne, 
in this case, he describes Mary, Mary Wynn as a strumpet. <laughs> and I don't know if you've noticed the name of the vicar, he is about the Reverend Trollope. <laughs> I kid you not, this is Spilby in Lincolnshire, uh, and I couldn't make it up. So just to point out, under Rose's Act, this is all that the vicar is expected to note down. When baptised, the name of the parents, where they're living, not the date of birth. This is very, very kind in um, the parish of Isleworth. The vicar has actually slotted in. He's added extra information that he wasn't obliged to do. He has put in the date of birth. And it's interesting by looking at that, the date of birth um, is normally just a few weeks, up to about four weeks before the baptism. That is not always the case. But the vicar is not obliged to. Remember when you're looking at church records, it's the evidence of christening shortly after the birth. Always kill your ancestors off. After 1812, the burial register gives the age at death. Well, as accurately as recorded by the informant, but as we've seen, the informants aren't always that great on, on, on death certificates anyway. But again, we be homicidal with your ancestors because you may get a clue of when they were born. Registers, of course, and, uh, were not abandoned in 1837, so you can save yourself a, a bug or two by looking for church records. Here's a burial <coughs> register, um, of course, giving evidence of age, of, of, of age, as I just said. And of course, the post, the, the uh, church records after 1837, um, copies of which were sent to the Registrar General, are becoming more and more available to us. So again, you, you, can, you can work your way around that. I hasten to add, I cannot stress how, how clearly um, the varied information of parish registers. Uh, here we've got, I've got a transcribed published register in the li from the Library of the Society of Genealogists. The, the, the posh people buried um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the church itself tend to have more information than just something like poor old widow Hoskins with no other information in the register. Um, again, this is purely at the discretion of the vicar of what he puts in his register. Sometimes it's incredibly informative, not only do you, but of course you've got the challenge of handwriting in, in understanding these early registers. So here we have um, further, sometimes a father's occupation. We've got Anne Susanna, Su Susanna Marie, the daughter of John Alexander Ireland, of Mrs. Baker's Company of Canadians. But here you've got science that it received into the congregation. Uh, usually an indication that the child might have been sickly at the um, time of birth. The uh, baptism, therefore, undertaken very quickly by the midwife. Child, child uh, can uh, survive and is then received into the congregation later. You sometimes see privately baptised. Again, these are clues of, of perhaps the, uh, of what's going on about the age might be slightly later than, than you'd expect. From these, from these baptismal registers. This is another city of London parish again, where the vicar has added a um, the, the date of christening and the date and the date of birth in the, in the material. It's purely at the at the discretion. Here, don't again, any good historian will check the original family search. We have the, the entries of um, Elizabeth Smith. The daughter of Susan Smith, baptised in 1828 in St. Wallace in Herefordshire. Um, inference being the father unknown, she is illegitimate. Well, there is an annotation in the original register which doesn't fit into the nice boxes of databases. So here we have the entry, Elizabeth, the daughter of Susan Smith, illegitimate, the father supposedly her own brother, but more probably the wanton preacher who was lodging in the family. <laughs> Three exclamation marks, a wolf in sheep's clothing, five exclamation marks. You might be able to investigate who the wanton creature might be. And indeed, you know, even if it's a story of incest not being one you wanted to find out, but they sometimes like you'll get those clues as well. So do go and look at the original register. I cannot stress this enough. So evidence of paternity. Well, I'm going to skip through a bit if I might about marriage. I think you know about marriage, myself, and I'm 
conscious translates it more. So putting families together into their family groups to make sense. So you can you know, make sense of the parish registers, put them in chronological order and then see if you can make sense. And then understand speculation. A, so the Edward Patrick who was buried in 1723, he might be the father of Richard, he might be the brother of Richard. We just don't know from that. So you, from these records, you may be having to add speculation into there. So what can supplement parish register material with all its vagaries that we're showing you? Well, all, all of these records, and I'm going to try my best to get through as many as I can in five minutes. Um, monumental inscriptions. This is a monument inscription of Anne Churchit, or Ch uh, my name is Churchill, Churchill, Churchyard, Churchyard. Please do not be, be, be prissy about the spelling of your name. It's only as good as the clerk that wrote it down. Anyway, there is an Anne Churchit in my family who could be this Anne Churchit who I found on a monumental inscription. The problem is that that monumental inscription in the parish of Flandern Arbor in Herefordshire, there's no burial in the registers to relate to that tombstone. That's the only evidence that I can find for her burial. Indeed, no, no genealogist can walk through a, or walk past a graveyard without having a wander around, can you? It is, it is the rule. But again, multi-generational information on monumental inscriptions. You could draw out some wonderful pedigrees from the three or four generations noted on, that, on those tombstones. Look for supplementary evidence about how your ancestors might have married. The uh, bond and allegation issued um, at the time of the license can give you clues. So here is an allegation in the um, in Essex, Essex licenses um, showing that uh, Samuel Pettican applied for an allegation, sorry, applied for a license, and alleged there was no reason due to pre-contract consanguinity or, or, or whatsoever that you shouldn't marry Margaret Beeson of the same parish. However, in the parish register, which just shows this marriage, there's no, no indication of their age. And so I just made that assumption that, you know, as you do, he married, he must have been in his 20s or 30s when he married her. Well, actually, the allegation gives me the clue that he actually was still a bachelor at the age of 50, and I just hadn't looked far enough for the baptism. So this extra supplementary information from the allegation had been incredibly useful for me for that purpose. The information that's not generally in records at all, but might be in family papers. This is in one of the collections of the Society of Genealogists with um, uh, a marriage settlement, like a prenuptial arrangement. There is a parish register entry. It's, date, it's indexed on online databases like Family Search. There is a marriage license relating to the marriage, and all of those documents come together to tell the story of that marriage. Non-conformity, of course, if, uh, the growth of non-conformity means you may not find your ancestors in the church records of the established church. Um, and of course, remember all um, uh, non-conformist denominations um, were obliged to, under Hardwick's Marriage Act to marry in the Church of England. Um, the only exception being uh, Jews and Quakers after Hardwick's Marriage Act of 1753. So I'm afraid Wesleyan's Baptists will be married in the um, uh, Anglican Church between 1754 and 1837. There may be clues about nonconformity, and there are other sources, particularly here in the National Archives in the RG series, RG series 4 to 8, readily available on various websites, including perhaps the, the, the first attempts at a kind of non Anglican registration for various nonconformist registries of birth. And um, here's an example of um, Florence Nightingale's birth overseas and then registered back here in the uh, nonconformist, uh, in the Dr. Williams Library uh, nonconformist registry, which has ended up here at National Archives. Probates. Um, again, evidence of death and burial and relationships. Uh, lots of lots of Churchill's uh, dirt poor, you think never never leaving wills, but actually in the 20th century, quite um, <coughs> Quite a considerable number of them do. Here's a, indeed, even though they didn't have much to leave, George Ernest Tertius Swinfield leaving his watch chain, his ladder, things like that. So again, uh, you can see the relationship, the names of married daughters, children. Um, this is, and again, same for pre-1858 wills. Uh, here I made an abstraction of the will of Thomas Arrowsmith the Elder, um, 
and you can see the family relationships. His son, uh, the, yeah, the second son, daughters, married, ma uh, married daughters, um, left with a small amount of money because they've made a settlement on them already, such as that marriage settlement that I showed you earlier on before. So they've made provision for them, so not, it's not, not a part of an argument. But again, the relationships that you can see, who, who the daughters marry, etc., uh, the age of, um, and the, the date of probate. Uh, in this case, the date of death is recorded in the will, but invariably you have the date the will was made and the date the will was probated, and um, you're looking for evidence of death between those years. Um, a couple of examples from apprentice records giving age, uh, particularly the, the parish poor law apprenticeships. Um, here is a parish apprenticeship for Mary Hartford, uh, a, a small child apprenticed into, the, a, into housewifery, essentially a little drudge, but her age here is eight years old. Again, an evidence of her age through that, through that early record. Uh, evidence of matrimony and patrimony, or, or you know, who the mother are, uh, who, who, who the father might be, by people living in cities and becoming freemen of the city, so Bristol, Canterbury, Coventry, York, etc. These are the Canterbury Freeman registers, and you can see here, for example, that um, fine one with matrimony. Peter Lambert gained his freedom because he married Elizabeth, the daughter of John Hamilton. Barbara and gentleman, another freeman of the parish. And John Lampard here, Glover, um, gained his freedom of the city by being, by through patrimony, being the son of Matthew Lampard. So these relationships can come in sort of formal civil records as well. Uh, so similar, similar things here for the Bristol freeman. Uh, I had a lot of problems working out which who the Turners were. And John, so John Turner, the brass founder, the extra occupation, which wasn't shown in the earlier um, parish registers. And from the, in here, actually, you have the migration as well as paternity being shown in the apprentice index, Richard Turner, the son of John Turner, later of Leicester. All um, right, I want to skip on, if I may, evidence of uh, paternity through the poor law, the uh, Bastardy bonds, uh, where a, 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 a father is identified uh, after a child becomes uh, a burden on the parish. So here we've got Horace Neal begatting a bastard child on Elizabeth Cock. She's chargeable to the parish, and so they try to, find, to get him to support the child. Here's another order against William Bridge, the father of Mary Morris. Again, she's, she's obliged um, after an act of uh, I think 17, um, 1780s, to identify who the father is. Uh, the father is pretty, uh, um, pretty useless and unable to support the illegitimate child. And in fact, here is a, his examination so they can get him out of the parish. And the examination tell, identifies all the places he lived as well as where he was born. Again, don't, don't fall for the idea that your ancestors didn't, map, didn't move around much. Uh, settlement material. One of my uh, proofs of evidences of, of who's related to whom, are, these are the suppositions I took from the parish register, but I found land documents in the um, uh, manorial records of the manor that governed the parishes where they were living with a mortgage and three lives lease confirming the relationships and the movement from one parish to another. Uh, again, you might get age and in, um, indication of uh, place of birth in the in military materials, such as the W097 uh, records uh, here at the National Archives. Um, and here's a collection from the Society of Genealogists, the Trinity House petitions, with uh, showing the family of mariners who had died and fallen on hard times that their children and their ages. I just want to finish off with two documents, if I may, just the last, the last two. Just not to trust certified records. This is a collection known as the Civil Service Evidence of Age, which were um, collected by the Civil Service Commission when they needed evidence that the civil service servant was coming up to um, sit his civil service examinations and had to prove that he was under 21 at the time. 
So they, they receive a certificate from um, relating to the birth of Patrick Maloney, born 5th of January 1857. There's a certified declaration from his mother Joanna that her son was indeed born on that day. And this is accompanied by, accompanied by a certified extract of baptisms from the uh, Catholic register signed by the priest saying that Patrick Maloney, um, that, so that the child was a son of Patrick Maloney and Mary, which had been crossed out and put Joanna Murphy, born the same day. Now clearly they were a bit puzzled about this because they aren't actually asked the postman, postmaster, to go back and check this out. He's on the ground and there is a letter from the postmaster that says this is utter rubbish. In fact, Patrick Maloney turns out to be the illegitimate son of Mary Murphy, baptised Patrick Murphy. Unfortunately, the candidate is unaware of his real name, having been misled by his mother and the circumstances of his birth. And this is accompanied by documentation proving that from the workhouse. Then there is a letter to the priest, which says, uh, excuse me, what's this certified entry from the, from the registers that you have submitted? Well, they said, oh, the mother came to me, she explained the circumstances of his birth and she didn't want to um, ex reveal these to her son. And we felt that, well, as long as you've got the right date of birth, it didn't really matter very much, did it? So he essentially forged an entry and sent it on her behalf. So all the way through, we know when he was born, because that's essentially what they thought he knew. But these records have been certified as true, just that they weren't. And in the same collection, my last document, um, that is perhaps the most bizarre evidence of age I've ever seen. This is the evidence of the age, admittedly born overseas, not a birth certificate that, to be had, but he submitted a translation of a Sanskrit horoscope <laughs> presented as evidence of his birth that took place on 25th of February 1849 in Bombay and it is certified by the chief translator um, to, his high, to, to his excellency, the high commissioner at Bombay and it goes into great depth to show you how they you know, check the schedules and this is what the, the date translates as. Well, I hope you don't have to look to the stars to find your information, <laughs> but just to say that there are plenty of clues that can be found for the information that we came to rely on after 1837. Thank you very much. <laughs>